next part of this week is actually about reading research papers itself. One of the goals for uh, this course is to also help you to understand how to read a research paper, particularly within the context of privacy and secure, online privacy. Right? And many, uh, meaning we have already seen the papers, but I kind of uh, discuss the content of the paper as uh, um, in the in the lectures. It'll be nice now to flip it and see you actually do uh, some readings of the papers and see how you can get understanding of topics from these papers. Why read research papers? To understand what's going on in literature, uh, to know what are the latest things, what are the novel work that people have done, why should you actually work on a problem, motivations for working on a problem, all that can come from reading a research paper. So how do you place the work, right? Well, meaning the YouTube recommendation system that I mentioned, how do you actually know that it's actually novel, nobody has done it? Only the research papers can help us do that, help us understand that. Highly recommend if you're working on a project for the course. I, I, I think that if, if you are reading, I mean, I, if it was a real class, what I, what I teach on campus, I would let you read the papers, come discuss, which I think I want to do this for, for the NPTEL model also, which is I, I think later in the slides, I have one paper that I posted there, which if, if uh, any of you are interested in reading it, you read it, we'll set up a time uh, in the semester, uh, just around this week seven, where we can actually come and discuss the paper. Discussion of the paper also, I have some ideas how better it can be done instead of uh, just this model of one person reading the paper and coming and discussing the paper. I stumbled on this uh, like about a year back, or no, probably seven, eight months back, uh, which is uh, to how reading research papers, uh, different ways of reading research papers. We were interested in because I think if, I mean, general model is that you ask one student to come and uh, you ask one student to read the paper, the one student will prepare some deck of slides, come present the paper and others will can ask questions. That's the general way by which paper reading happens one, two, three students do it together. But here is another interesting way, and I've been practicing this for last uh, uh, a semester or so uh, in reading papers. I think it's, it's very effective, not just uh, uh, with the students that I work with, I also tried this in the class that I taught on campus. It seems to have worked very well. How does it work? Instead of one person reading the paper, there are gonna be seven people reading the paper now and presenting it, meaning I think the goal is that in a paper discussion, everybody reads the paper, uh, because without that, if you come to the paper reading discussion, it's generally not going to be very useful. So instead of 1% presenting the paper, we're going to get like seven people to present the paper. But these seven people will have different types of roles that they're going to play in discussing the paper. Okay. So we should we will try this in the class uh, in, a, in an online session. Um, or in an offline session also, now that things may be better in the January 2022 semester. Again, if people are interested in coming to campus and trying this out, we can try it. So here is what uh, uh, the different roles are, right? So the first one is scientific uh, 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 peer reviewer, which is the paper has not been published um, and uh, uh, yet and is currently submitted to a top conference. Essentially, the, the, the role of this is uh, the, the role of this particular reviewer um, is to read the paper as though it's uh, they are reviewing the paper for a conference and giving suggestions on what good and what not good. So generally, a paper acceptance, uh, paper reviews has this, why should I accept the paper? Why should I reject the paper? Uh, comments to the authors, all of that. Can the students reading the paper prepare that? Archaeologist. This is an interesting one. Uh, this paper was found uh, uh, buried underground in, in a desert. You're an archaeologist who, who must determine whether this paper sits in the context of the previous or the subsequent work. So the goal here is, um, a few minutes before I said, right, which is why do you need research papers? To place the research that you're doing, you need to understand what the literature is. There's also this understanding that uh, you, the quality of your research is highly dependent on the literature that you're aware of, right? or even limited by the literature that you're aware of. So find a uh, report uh, uh, on a uh, older uh, paper cited within the current paper that substantially influenced the current paper, blah, blah, blah. So this is basically archaeologist's goal is to go look at, 
is the paper placed properly uh, and and give give feed give their thought on uh, the positioning of the paper academic researcher you are a researcher who's working on a new project in this area uh, propose an imaginary follow up project not just based on the current but only possible due to the existence and success of the current paper so this is basically an idea of okay now i want to do a follow up study what would that be industry practitioner you work at a company uh, or an organization developing an application or product uh, of your choice uh, bring a convincing pitch for why you should uh, why you should be paid to implement the method in this paper this is actually an interesting one uh, because many papers uh, don't get converted into a implementation right so the the role of the industry practitioner is to say that look this paper does this um, for example uh, let's take the facebook nudges paper uh, three nudges right uh, the paper evaluated the three nudges should we explore these types of nudges implemented in facebook and actually try it out and see it with the users why would that why should somebody try it what, what is the and discuss at least one positive or negative impact of this application let's take you build it and put it there why would users like it why should uh, users use it all that is a question that uh, industry practitioners should look at right so that was the four uh, roles the rest of the three roles are these the first one is the hack the sort of say, fifth one is the hacker in this role you're a hacker who needs to who needs a demo of this paper as soon as possible implement a small pod or a simplified version of the paper on a small data set or a toy problem prepare to share the core uh, code of the algorithm to the class and demo your implementation do not simply download and run an experiment existing implementation so the idea here is that hacker should try out what is going on by themselves and bring the code show the code walk through the code all of that to be done though you're welcome to use an existing implementation for backbone code so helping uh, users uh, helping the student who's reading the paper as a hacker uh, to get a sense is to actually build it it's light slightly intense than how naturally paper reading is done private investigator you are a detective who needs to run a background check on one of the paper's authors uh, where have they worked what did they study what previous projects m might have led to working on this one so essentially this private detective is to doing a background work on the authors uh, he or she was the uh, phd student uh, at this institute and they were working with the last author last author being the postdoc advisor or the phd thesis advisor before this paper this to uh, the first author actually wrote another paper which is published in this conference and that paper was also on privacy blah 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 Right, so that's how a private investigator would do. Social impact assessor, I think the name itself gives it away. Identify how this paper uh, self assesses its uh, impact on the world. Have any additional positive impacts left out? What are the positive, negative, uh, possible negative social impacts that were overlooked or omitted? So interesting, interesting things that uh, roles do. And, and I've been using this model for, for last about a semester, uh, reading papers and then playing these roles, coming up with uh, uh, hacks, coming up with actually social impact assessment, all that. It's been very, very useful thanks to the uh, blog, which actually talks about methods to do uh, these seven roles. And, and I would like to try out in the class also. Uh, so we will see if we can actually do a session where some of you read the paper in these roles and come. So I, I put a, a paper that we should do as part of this week's content itself. Please read this paper. It's, it's, it's not a very intense paper. Uh, very simple, very, very uh, so highly cited paper in that sense, uh, but very, very uh, intuitive, uh, nicely done paper. So if you can read this paper, we can actually do these roles uh, and uh, see how well you're able to capture the idea of reading the papers that are around privacy also. So to help uh, uh, you understand how these roles are done, 
the next 30 minutes or so, a paper was taken and that paper recording uh, how students did uh, interact with these roles uh, is recorded and I've actually put it as uh, part of this video itself. So please watch it before you actually start reading it yourself, uh, reading this paper for yourself uh, and, and uh, see how these roles can be done. It'll be super nice if you try it once. A couple of papers for the class also. Good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting Fox, protecting privacy against unauthorized deep learning models today. Due to the developments in deep learning, facial recognition systems are successfully scanning millions of citizens in different countries without explicit consent. This situation is compounded by the fact that facial recognition systems are easy to build, the models are only getting faster to train, and the hardware to train them is getting cheaper. It's also extremely easy to misuse these models for your own gain. One such example is clearview.ai, which some of you must have heard about. It has up to 3 billion images in their database. They scrape this data from social networks without user consent, violating user privacy in an unfair manner. This data can be used for malicious purposes in the wrong hands, such as for extortion and stalking. Thus, securing our data against such usage is of paramount importance. To that end, in this paper, the authors provide a defense against such attacks called FOX to protect people from being identified by unauthorized facial recognition models. First, let us understand how exactly this data is obtained and misused. The users upload images on the web to some social media such as Facebook, Twitter, etc., which are then further scraped by a web crawler. These images are then used to train a facial recognition model with your images. To circumvent this, the authors propose that users use Fox to first cloak images before uploading it to the web. This would help fool the model when these images are scraped as the model will be trained on false training data. And when a clean image is compared with this data, it will not be able to recognize this person. Since the feature, the, since the feature space is essentially changed by this cloaking, this helps the model to realize, to, to, to get fooled uh, when, when a real image is presented to it. And we shall see more of this in the next slides. An important point the authors note is that these images do not change visually after cloaking. That is, they maintain their usability. So let, let us understand how these cloaks are generated and what are the requirements for the same. First, cloaks should be imperceptible and not impact normal usage of the image. Secondly, cloaks should make true class mimic feature representation of target class, which we'll talk more about in depth. Third, perturbations in images should be indistinguishable by humans. The images on the right show that without cloaking, the feature extractor can distinguish between two classes U and T. But with the feature extractor, we can confuse the model from a class U to T. As you can see, the decision boundaries between um, between class U and class T is now merged and it's not able to distinguish between the two classes. Similarly, in the image below, you can see something similar happening. Before cloaking, the target class, which is X, and the original images, which is shown by this delta, this yellow color on the right, are separate. But after cloaking, both of them are present in the same feature space. So how should we go about choosing a target class T? We can choose any random class, but there is a better way to choose these classes. And the authors propose an algorithm to do the same. Firstly, to choose this class T, we want to select the class which is most dissimilar from the initial class. This helps the model, this helps the cloak to fool the model in a better manner. The authors do this by taking K candidate target classes and their images from a public data set and use a feature extractor Phi to calculate the centroid of the feature space for each of the class. Then to centroid, then to choose the centroid representation, which is the most dissimilar for, for the initial class. Let's say that class is U. They calculate this distance using the L2 norm, which is essentially um, the, the root over uh, the squared difference of all dimensions of the, of the feature space. And uh, the feature extractor can, can be anything. You can use ResNet, you can use whichever feature extractor that you want. Um, and the authors compare different feature extractors in their results. Right. So now that you have chosen um, this class T, 
we want to understand how this cloak is generated. What what perturbations do you do to make sure that your images are cloaked? To that end, the authors use a structural dissimilarity index to calculate this cloak. This index maintains the usability of images. That is, you will not recognize the difference. Visually, you will not be able to recognize the difference between two images, but the pixels are edited slightly to make sure that these images are cloaked. They make sure that this, this difference between the two images, which is called delta x, uh, comma xt, um, right here in the formula, this, this is less than p, which is a value that they keep, which is the perturbation value that they have to keep below a certain amount such that, the, such that visually the images do not change. So essentially, they want to transform one image class to another class where maintaining a certain degree of similarity with the initial class. And so they use this formula where they keep, where they minimize this, where they minimize this difference delta and, and transform one feature space to the other, maintaining some properties of the initial feature space. The authors show the efficacy of their model in different conditions. They call the baseline conditions the one where the extractor used by the tracker or the hacker, if you want to call them, and the user the same. In this case, the authors show that the, the cloaking works in almost 100% with, with almost 100% success rate. In all of the models that they use, as you can see, if they use VGD2 with Incept, VGD2 with Tens, the accuracy with which they're able to cloak is almost is almost 100% in each of the cases. And if you look at this figure down below, um, you will see that the cloaked images and the original images are pretty much the same. We can't visually tell the difference between the two. For us, both of these images remain the same, but there's slight variations in them so that the facial recognition model, which is trained on say one image, um, let's say on the cloaked image, is not able to recognize the original image when compared against it. On the right-hand side, you can see this graph where um, based on the perturbation, uh, you can see the protection success rate. So if you, if you increase the perturbations from um, 0 0.002 to 0, 0, 0 0.01, the success rate for protection increases. But an important point to note here is that you, the, the images, um, so the cloaked image and the original image will start appearing dissimilar if you approach this value 0 0.01. So that is why you need to keep this budget smaller. You need to either stay below 0 0.008 to maintain, um, to, to visually maintain the similarity between the original and the cloaked images. So under realistic conditions, we, we can't really hope uh, to assume that we, we will have um, we, that, that we'll have the same feature extractor in both cases. Uh, that you know when, when a tracker is using a feature extractor and you are using a feature extractor, that they would be the same. Realistically, they would be different. You don't know how the facial recognition system is trained. Because since it's possible for the tracker to even use transfer learning or scratch a model from scratch, it makes sense that the feature uh, that the feature extractor they use will be different from yours. So the conditions that we saw earlier were not realist were not realistic at all. These conditions are, not, are baseline conditions. They will not happen in real life. So the authors present their their cloaking technology, their cloaking method um, in this case as well, and they show that in in all of these cases, in cases where the uh, where a tracker trains the model from scratch or uses transfer learning from a pre-trained model. For example, they're using ResNet and they're uh, using transfer learning on that model. The, the protection rate remains above 90% in those cases as well. It even works well in deployed systems. For example, it, they, they tried with Microsoft Azure Face API, Amazon Recognition Face Verification, and Face++. As you can see down here, they used all three of these APIs and protect and with, with protection, they, they were able to achieve a 100% success rate. So if, if, if you go even more in depth, um, in case, in, so in, in a realistic condition, we can expect that some of our images are uncloaked, which are presented to the model. Um, since we already have images on Facebook, even if we cloak our images right now, um, we will have some uncloaked images that would have been scraped by the web crawler. So the authors considered that condition as well. And they, they run some experiments and they, they show that the success rate drops below 39% if more than 15% of the user's images are uncloaked. Now, this is a little uh, problematic because most of our images are already online. So either we have to delete them and upload cloaked images, which is not, um, which is not feasible. Uh, so the authors also present a different method to um, a sort of a, a hack to, 
to help you maintain these uh, images online, uh, which which are also which which are unclosed. These are called Sybil accounts. Sybil accounts are essentially a duplicate account that you have on the same social networking site. For example, on Facebook, I will have one one original account and one duplicate account where I'll be uploading similar images. This helps because when the uh, web crawler is crawling images from a social network, they will crawl images from your Sybil account as well as your original account, thus providing you more protection if your Sybil account has cloaked images. So this essentially helps. Um, th this essentially mitigates that effect that if you have um, some uncloaked images online which are already uh, available to the web crawler, uh, you these accounts help you mitigate that. As you can see um, in in this image down below, um, with, with without Sybil accounts, the feature extractor is able to distinguish um, and create a decision boundary between different images of of class. Of, they're able to like essentially distinguish. For example, if you look at uh, the green deltas, these are leaked images of you, and these are the cloaked images of you, and they're able to distinguish between the two. However, with Sybil, this distinguish they're not able to distinguish between these two classes, and um, so yeah, so just just to conclude, uh, Fox can provide protection against facial recognition systems in the real world. The images generated are visually similar to originals, thus making it hard to recognize uh, images that you have cloaked versus images that are uncloaked. The model works well unless some uncloaked images are available to it, which the features purpose. But the authors also present an alternate way to secure images, which are called Sybil accounts, which essentially help. Uh, protect your privacy, even if uncloaked images are available to the web crawler. Thanks. That's yeah. it for me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tushan. I think that was fantastic for getting the summary of the paper. <laughs> and now we'll have uh, academic reviewer. Uh, as I said earlier in the video, uh, there are there are different roles that we will see in, um, uh, in uh, students playing in reviewing this paper, giving uh, what they think about the paper. So now we'll have... Uh, uh, reviewers uh, uh, talk about what they think of the paper. Scientific reviewers, we complete a full review of the paper and recommend whether the paper should be accepted or rejected in the conference. So some of the paper strengths which we will discuss here are, first point, the introduction and the related works are very well researched. There is an extensive introduction and related work section that spans over almost five pages that explains the problem well and gives real world examples. The related work cites other papers in the domain of privacy and specifically cloaking, which, and there is a very thorough literature review in the field. Second point, the paper is, the model is applicable by real world users. The model is production scalable. It is practical to use by users as there is visibly no difference between cloaked and uncloaked images. The code of the model is open sourced, which implies that anyone can use it or modify it according to their own, according to their own case. The model, uh, the paper has a very pertinent problem statement. It highlights the importance of protecting one's images and the danger of face recognition in the present world scenario by giving real world examples such as of Clearview.ai. The model is highly reliable and robust. It provides a 95% plus chance of success, irrespective of how the face identification model is trained. It provides 100% success of robust cloaking against state-of-art facial recognition services from Microsoft, that is the Azure Face API, Amazon, which is the recognition model, and Face++. The very important point here is that the effectiveness of robust cloaking will remain same after data augmentation and transformations. Another, the last point is that different real life possibilities have been considered in the model and solutions have been suggested for them. For example, in the case where the hacker has uncloaked images of the user, the user can make a Sybil account to flood the training set of the hacker with cloaked images, thus making the face identification model perform poorly and keeping the identity of the user private. Now we will discuss the paper weaknesses. As Ayushi mentioned, the box paper tackles an important problem and proposes a unique solution. Whilst we have discussed the strengths of the paper, as reviewers, we must also look at its weaknesses. Some of the weaknesses we found were one, 
This model can be used by malicious agencies to hide their identity. Of course, this is a problem that occurs with various privacy solutions. But this paper fails to discuss this in detail. What if some malicious agencies like criminals uh, come into play and we need to use the facial recognition model to identify them? The paper conveniently leaves discussing this out this trade-off between the user privacy and the authorized use of the same to future work. Second, we find that this model is not as useful if a user's pictures are already online in abundance. They say that the uh, user then has to create civil accounts and upload more such photos that are cloaked. Now, this is very cumbersome for a user to do. The next weakness that we find is that the UI of the model is not very well explained. He believes that the paper could have included more flow diagrams and better illustrations to explain how the model really works. Finally, we find that the software is not easy to use. We do appreciate the authors making the code open source and putting the model up to the public, but the instructions are not very detailed, and so only tech savvy people can use this model for now. If a regular user wants to cloak their images, they may find it very difficult to do so. Overall, we find that the paper, despite having some weaknesses, it has much stronger reasons for acceptance. Thus, both reviewer one and reviewer two believe that this paper deserves a strong accept. On a scale of strong reject, weak reject, weak accept, and strong accept, where strong accept is the highest score the paper can receive. And thus, we believe it should go forward for publication. Thank you. That's all we have from the peer reviewers. Thanks, thanks, Ayushi and uh, Shraddha for reviewing the paper. I was just wondering as you were speaking whether if the, if the authors of the paper actually listen to this, they would actually look at us and say that, oh, students actually reviewing our paper and giving reviews. Thanks uh, again. Now let's move on to the next uh, role, uh, uh, industry practitioners. We have Bhavijit and Pooja. So hi, everyone. I'm Pooja. And for this PM, my role is that of an industry practitioner. So an industry practitioner goes through the paper and tries to see if it has some real world implementations. And if currently any companies or industries are using this methodology, or if possible, if this could be used in the future in a company or industry based implementation. So as has been mentioned before, the code for this Fox model is open source and is available on their website. However, it's only meant for users who are familiar with using a com command line interface on their computer. Currently, the, it's been downloaded more than 500,000 times. So we can say that it has been, has seen a widespread usage and they have released this free software for both Windows and Mac operating systems. So there were two versions that were released. The initial version brought significant and visible changes to the original picture. So after there were complaints and feedback given to the authors of the paper, they updated the initial version and released the second iteration of the model where the photos look the same even after cloaking. So the authors believe that in order for this, their work to have large scale impact and in order for this to uh, blow up in a global scale, it has to be integrated with platforms, social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram where photo sharing is a predominant part of using the platform. So people, it would be, um, in the future, it would be a nice option if users automatically had a choice if they would want to upload cloaked photos and if the social media platform themselves provided this option rather than the user having to cloak their photos beforehand and then uploading onto these platforms. Currently, the authors of the paper are working on building an app which can provide this feature for you, which is much more user friendly than having to download the software and figuring out how to use it on your own. So Clearview AI, which was the company that has scraped over 3 billion photos of faces online and which was talked about during the paper summary discussion. So when asked the founder of this company, when they were asked for a statement against a model like Fox, which could fool their facial recognition model, he stated that he believes Fox would fail against his massive facial recognition database and also stated that they believe that the recognition algorithm would actually be made stronger because of a model called Fox. However, when the author was asked for a comment against what Mr. Huan Ton said, he had stated that this uh, 
the Fox model still holds, since what the Clearview CEO suggested has to do with adversary, adversarial training, which doesn't work against a poisoning attack, which is what the cloaking model is based on. So he still stands by the Fox model and states that it would still continue to fool those facial recognition models. So if we look at real world performance, so actual companies that use the APIs that were talked about before, that this Fox model would end up fooling and would provide protection against, some companies such as Uber and Jet.com use the Microsoft Azure Face API facial recognition system. Organizations such as the NFL, CBS, National Geographic, and ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Organization in the US also use this Amazon recognition API. And also Alipay, which is a major form of payment service in China, uses the Face++ um, API. So all these companies, the Fox model would provide a protection against. That is all for the industry practitioners. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm the social impact assessor for the paper Fox. I'll be discussing the positive and the negative social impact of the paper. Yeah. So the main problem, the social problem that is being addressed by the paper is the unauthorized and the unaccountable use of facial recognition system. The continuing example that we have discussed in this paper is of Clearview AI, which was able to uh, scrape multiple images from online social media platforms and was able to correct and create a big facial recognition system, which not only is unauthorized, but unaccountable to the various, various government sites and can access your information and recognize your uh, photos. So to uh, attack this problem, they had created a new tool called Fox, which was able to mitigate this problem. But the positive impacts of the paper could be seen as that the Fox algorithm helped safeguard the photos on online social media platforms from being used to train facial recognition systems without their consent. So this creates a safe environment for people to post on these online social media platforms without being uh, worried about their photos being used for unauthorized purposes. So this is an example of where people or uh, researchers had created an algorithm to distinguish between uh, discriminated society, discriminated segments of the society and was were asked to take off their uh, paper from the internet. So one of the negative impacts that was also discussed in the paper, but was left as the future work was that similar to many privacy enhancing tools and technology, Fox can also be used by malicious bad actors. The criminals can use Fox to hide their identity from federal agencies and would be unaccountable to the law. So one of the uh, impacts that I think the uh, authors were ma uh, missed for the paper was that even though the facial recognition uh, systems might be authorized, but they still have a lot of bias in them. So as you can see, multiple studies have shown that uh, bias in terms of the gender or the color of the skin creeps into this model because of the data sets that are being used to train these models. So they, most of the time, these models perform worse for uh, people with darker skin tone or with uh, would also perform worse for uh, female gender. There are multiple such studies, and one such uh, recent study was uh, also in the form of a doc Netflix documentary called Coded Pie. So other innovative ideas that have also been introduced uh, by many researchers have been as in terms of clothing accessories to help people stay away from these uh, facial recognition soft software where people can uh, add these adversarial patch and they can then be protected from these facial recognition software. So another example of this uh, innovative ideas was of uh, LED glasses, which people can use to mitigate the problem of facial recognition software. So in all, the paper addresses a very important social problem. And it's not just the unauthorized use, but also the bias that creeps into these facial recognition software that the paper helps uh, to stop. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mudit. Uh, now we'll have uh, a hacker role uh, who will talk about uh, uh, the paper. Akshila? Yeah, so as a hacker, I had to look at the implementation of the paper. The authors have made the source code publicly available. It is available at this GitHub link. So when you're running the code, there are different modes which are available. 
so the there's like a minimum medium and high mode so the higher the mode is the more perturbation will be added in the cloaked image and it would provide a stronger protection so i tried out the code with different images and different perturbation levels so like this first one is the original image this is with a low perturbation this is with a medium perturbation and this is high perturbation so as you can see all of these images look identical only so the cloaks are imperceivable so this is verifying what has been mentioned in the paper that their implementation would yield images which are imperceivable so like someone would not be able to distinguish between the original and cloaked image with the naked eye so what basically is happening in this code is that uh, the model is uh, look it is picking up pictures from public data set so it picks up like k groups of images in which each group has photos of different people then using a feature extractor the centroid the centroid of feature space of this these images is being calculated so this is happening for the k groups of images of different people and for the cloaked image also the centroid of feature space is being calculated then afterwards the l2 distance between the cloaked images and all of these groups is calculated so we select the group which has the highest l2 distance so highest l2 distance would imply that this group is most dissimilar to the images that have to be cloaked now from the selected group we randomly pick up one image and using this image we calculate the structural dissimilarity index and using that we get the cloak now this structural dissimilarity index has an input parameter which controls the perturbation so different modes as we saw previously these low medium high modes this can be given as an input parameter while calculating the cloak and you can get different images as it we had seen in the previous slide so this was the implementation and algorithm of the paper thanks thanks uh, akshala now let's go to a private investigator uh, uh, naman okay so hi i'm naman and i was the private investigator for the project uh, for this paper and what i what my job was to look into the history of uh, the authors what kind of research that they've been doing and what may have led to uh, you know uh, this pro uh, this uh, project so uh, i uh, so we did, we will talk about the first authors who were there they were two first authors for the paper who were also the project leads and then the advisors for the papers so the first uh, project lead was shoshan who is current who is uh, Uh, be a phd student at the university of chicago so this research this paper was uh, research was done at the university of chicago at the sand lab which stands for security algorithms networking and data basically and they work in research topics like security machine learning networking systems uh, hci data mining and modeling so uh, shoshan uh, had uh, did his btech in computer science from the university of chicago and then he started his phd at the sand lab under ben y gao and hither jain who are the co advisors for this project also so uh, before this project i think uh, just, uh, talking about uh, previous projects uh, for shoshan in 2018 uh, he published a paper on user reactions to longitudinal transparency about third party web tracking which basically uh, uh, tried to give users a better understanding of what all data can third party apps track from a user's browsing history so this the aim of this project was to again give tell the users that okay all of this what is the extent to which third party apps can track your data which was i think uh, a good uh, 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 it was a very crucial research that was done uh, uh, to make uh, from the users and to understand how private is their data on the internet so apart from this in 2019 uh, he also worked on a very similar project in identifying and mitigating backdoor attacks in neural networks so basically in this this was published at the IEEE symposium on security and privacy which where they were trying to basically prevent uh, backdoor attacks on uh, neural networks which and what backdoor attacks basically mean is that if the if the input image contains a certain possible trigger it can uh, bring down the whole neural network and it can basically uh misidentify the image into any anyone they want to so to uh mitigate this these backdoor attacks uh, input filters neural proning and unlearning were some of the techniques that uh, they proposed in this paper so i think these were this uh, research that he did as an undergraduate and then 
in 2020 he started his phd at the sang lab where he has done his previous research so <laughs> uh, so talking about the second author now which was emily wenger she had her a bachelor's of science in mathematics and physics from beaten university and then she started her phd in the um, university of chicago from 2018 so she has worked as an intern at facebook ai research he's working as an intern and uh, her uh, research basically explores practical limitations privacy violations and security threats of deep neural networks so um, a lot of work that emily wenger has done in this domain has been with uh, shoshan which is the other only for the project so one uh, relevant project that they worked on was piracy resistant watermarks for deep neural networks which was basically a strategy to uh, tackle piracy attacks against false claims of ownership uh, uh, on deep neural networks so basically what they proposed was a null embedding system which is basically a new method to build a watermark into a deep neural network which can only be put in the time of training therefore nobody can uh, so to say steal it or basically claim a false ownership uh, on a network so <clears throat> some of the projects that as i said before uh, like emily wenger and shoshan have uh, worked together in the uh, they have worked uh, in this domain for a while and after fox also they have uh, published two papers one was called blacklight which is again defending black box adversarial attacks in deep neural networks and got to catch them all is again using high pods to catch attacks on neural networks so basically emily wenger and shoshan because of their phd's also lie in a very similar domain again uh, exploring security and privacy of uh, deep neural networks i think they have been, yeah so this is their uh, research now let's talk about the uh, advisors of the lab so first was heeter jeng who is the co advisor director at the sand lab at university of chicago her phd was from university of maryland electrical and computer engineering and she has over 20000 citations in mobile computing wireless networks security and privacy so she was also a part of the mit technology review in 2005 for her work on cognitive radios and before uh, being the director at university of chicago she was a professor at the university of california santa barbara so and interestingly ben y gao was also a professor there at uh, university of california santa barbara uh his bs in computer science was from yale 97 then her, his masters and phd from berkeley 2000 2004 so uh, uh he is also a very renowned scientist in the field of adversarial machine learning and human computer interaction security he has over 32000 citations and he's been awarded the acm distinguished scientist award and the nsf career award so his area of research is include p2p networks online social networks user behavior analysis to name some and since 2016 he has been working in this domain of uh, security and privacy problems of machine learning and mobile systems yeah so that is all from my side yeah thanks uh, thanks naman uh, for for the background on uh, the uh, the authors so that's how paper uh, reading is done so i i hope uh, uh that gave uh, students an idea for how to read a paper what kind of different roles you can actually look at the paper and what to take from the paper so what we have covered for this week is user studies then uh, how to read, read research papers what are the roles that you could play i think we can get into the details of uh, generally what the paper is all that let me see how the uh, appetite for the class is how much uh, uh, students are interested in this depending on your interest i could actually add more content we can ca- we can add that content even during the semester that you are uh, going to take this class and uh, we will we can um, uh, go through some more papers uh, understand what are the details in writing the paper how the paper is built all that okay so that's the content for uh, week 7 uh, thank you for watching mm-hmm.